At Fermilab, we study nature at its most fundamental, drilling down to the smallest scales of matter using some of the largest and most advanced machines in the world. Accelerators, powerful microscopes, send particles barreling at near light speed into other matter, creating subatomic scraps. Detectors zoom in on those fleeting pieces, making the invisible perceptible. And sophisticated computers sweep through all of it, crushing mountains of information into gems of data. We also use our cutting edge technology to explore the mysteries of dark matter and the quantum realm. Thousands of scientists from around the world partner with Fermilab to explore how the universe works, expanding humanity's understanding of matter, energy, space, and time. Fermilab is solving the mysteries of the universe. Hi everyone and welcome to this virtual tour of muon G minus the muon GI minus two experiments um, as part of Fermilab's virtual open house. We're really excited that you are able to be here with us today. My name is Amanda Early and I work in the education and public engagement office as a program leader. And joining me today as part of the virtual tour is Bryn McCoy and Simon Crody. And um, Bryn, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and the work that you do at the lab. Hey, yeah, um, I'm Bryn McCoy. I'm a PhD student at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I work on the Muon G-2 experiment. So I travel back and forth to Fermilab under normal conditions, uh, travel back and forth to Fermilab. I'm sitting in Seattle right now, um, and I work on different parts of the experiment related to the location and motion of the muons uh, in our experiments. So a couple of things that I've worked on is a system of detectors that images the intensity of the muons when they're being transported to our experiment. And I have also worked on analyzing the strength of the magnetic field that the muons experience inside our experiment. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Simon, if you wanna introduce yourself. Hello everyone, my, my name is Simon Kuroi. I'm, I'm a postdoc at Argonne National Lab. Argonne National Lab is, is really next to, to to Fermilab, it's just like 40 minutes by, 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 by car. Um, I work kind of on the similar topics as Brin does. I, I really focus on G minus two on measuring the magnetic field um, to as good as we can. I think you're gonna see this later in the video. Awesome, and again, thank you so much uh, both for being here so that you can uh, take questions from our audience today. Um, to start with, in this virtual tour, we wanted to kind of give everyone a similar background on the muon GS minus two experiment. If you've been following, they had some really exciting first results released back in April. So we're just going to show a little bit of that to, um, like I said, kind of level set so you all have a similar background. Please feel free to put questions that you have in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will get to as many of those questions as we can um, between this video and the virtual tour, and then also at the end. For centuries, people have watched tops wobble as they spin on tables. But recently, scientists have had their eyes on the wobble of fundamental particles called muons. Scientists have made incredibly precise calculations of how muons should move. So making an equally precise measurement of this property is a good test of the theoretical model. If theory and experiment don't agree, then there must be undiscovered particles or forces at work. But first, what exactly is a muon? So a muon can be thought of as a heavier cousin of an electron. It's about 200 times more uh, massive, and it has many of the same properties that an electron has. Um, except that because it's heavier, it can also decay, and in general it takes about two microseconds and then it decays into an electron. Most importantly, muons are electrically charged particles with a property called spin. As a result, they behave as if they have internal magnets. So a muon has this quantity which effectively means that if you put it in a magnetic field, it spins around just exactly like a spinning top. And the G factor this G number that we're trying to measure directly relates um, the strength of the magnetic field 
to the spin of the muon and tells you how quickly the muon will spin when it's in that magnetic field. So the G factor causes the muon spin to wobble when you put it inside a magnetic field. Scientific theories initially predicted that the muon should have a G factor equal to exactly two. But it wasn't so simple. So in general, you might think that the vacuum itself, if you just have a vacuum chamber with nothing in it, um, there's nothing there. But in reality, due to something called the uncertainty principle, we have particles that come in and out of existence for just a blip. And so they come in and then they vanish again, and then they, they appear and vanish again. And so as our muons are going around, they're not only interacting with the magnetic field, but they're also interacting with these virtual particles, which come in and out of existence. I like to think of it a bit like when you put too many pieces of paper behind a fridge magnet. If you add an extra one in there, it doesn't feel the force as much and it will fall off your fridge. The muon's going to just slightly, for a tiny amount of time, feel a slightly different amount of force, depending which virtual particle got in the way. In June of 2020, a collaboration of more than 170 scientists completed an extraordinarily complex set of calculations and arrived at this value for the muon's g-factor. The more precisely we can measure the speed, the more sensitive we are to learning about different types of these virtual particles. And the hope is that eventually, if we measured it really, really precisely, we might be sensitive to new particles um, from beyond the standard model that no one's measured yet. That's where Fermilab's muon G-2 experiment comes in. The muon G-2 experiment involves taking muons and we put them inside a big magnet where we store them and send them around and around. And while they're in there, we measure the frequency at which their spin rotates within the magnetic field. So we can measure this quantity very precisely and it can also be predicted very precisely. And the main goal of the experiment is to make the measurement and compare with the theory. Um, and if they disagree, then it's telling us that there's something in nature which is not in the theory. So the thing in nature is affecting the measure measured value um, and making it different from the theory which doesn't contain this new physics. In 2013, an enormous 50-foot magnet traveled 3,200 miles by land and sea from Brookhaven National Lab in New York to Fermilab. This magnet is hundreds of times stronger than those magnets on your refrigerator. So this experiment builds on a previous experiment that ran at Brookhaven National Laboratory around the 2000 mark. It's a very similar experiment, um, actually using the same magnet to store the muons. It's a C-shaped magnet, which is seven meters in radius. And the unique feature of the magnet is how well shim it is, how uniform the magnetic field of the magnet is. So it's not only a big yoke of steel, there are many, many small shims, small parts we can use to tune the field to high uniformity. So the Brookhaven experiment measured exactly the same thing that we're trying to measure in the Fermilab experiment. And the reason that we're doing it again is because it produced this really, really exciting result. And the reason it was so exciting is that it was quite significantly different from the standard model prediction. And nobody was expecting it and no one had really had a good explanation for why, but it wasn't enough different to call it a discovery of something new. For it to be called a discovery, the gap between the theory and the experiment has to be really, really more precisely known. So the theory community worked on reducing their error bars and for the experiment side, we need to repeat the experiment with um, much higher statistics in order to reduce the error bar. Improvements in the particle beam, experimental equipment and methods allow researchers to make a measurement four times more precise than the original Brookhaven experiment. The new measurement has an extremely high level of precision, the equivalent of measuring the length of a football field with an uncertainty smaller than the width of a human hair. It's just ridiculously precise. We're all going to be super proud that we managed to measure this precise number. Now, after four years of assembling and calibrating the magnet and more than a year of data collection and analysis, the Muon G-2 collaboration has its first result. The unblinding was an incredible moment for the team. We finally agreed the analysis was complete and we had to what we call open the envelope where the secret to cipher code is. So that number then got typed into a computer with 
nearly 200 people watching at a special Zoom meeting. Whoa! Wow! Oh, oh uh, my God. Yeah. Well, Woo! Woo! The new result does not agree with the standard model prediction, but it does agree with the previous experiment published almost 20 years ago. You can see the standard model on the left side, and you see the new average of the experiments on the right side. And there's a big gap of white space between them. As the gap gets bigger, this is what we mean by the significance. Many people ask whether we have really discovered something, but in our field, we like to set the bar of the significance of a new result pretty high, higher than most people might say. If you think about this in terms of a football field and you're trying to score a touchdown, we're in the red zone right now. We're in the red zone. And we need a little bit more data to either push it over, but you never know if the defense is gonna come along, that being the standard model, and just kick us back. So we're sort of close, but not quite there. This is outstanding confirmation of experimental technique and very, very suggestive of the possibility of new physics. That's what we're after. That's the game. Luckily, the Fermilab Muon G-2 experiment is not over yet. The team plans to carry out a total of five runs of the experiment by 2022. An analysis of the complete dataset should reveal whether the wobbling of the muon represents a resounding success of the standard model, or rather, the sign of exciting new physics waiting to be explored. It doesn't matter how many times I see the unblinding video. I It's just awesome. Like just what that must have felt like. So I'm actually kind of curious. We'll start with um, Bryn and Simon, um, what your reaction was as you know, you've done all this work and you've been a part of this, what your reaction was when you, when you saw that result, Simon, if you want to start. It, it really felt surreal. Somehow it was during the pandemic. So we were all at home. So we kind of, we were really kind of looking forward to this day for, I would say, months, and we knew it's going to come, and, and it was really, we, we had no idea what's going to happen, and, and it was really kind of building up all this tension, and, and this is really, yeah, it's really a lot of tension, and, and it just really, really curious to, to know what happens, but then all, we were not together, but we were all um, kind of alone at, at, at home, right, that we were not allowed to talk with people about it before, so it was really like intense, little overwhelming, I would say, moment to, to finally see the, I don't know, see, see the, the result of all this hard work for, for so long time. Awesome. Uh, Bryn? Yeah, um, yes, it was, it was really exciting and it kind of took a few seconds or maybe a minute to fully sink in for me. Uh, and it was, it was kind of interesting, like Simon said, because we're all sitting there on Zoom in our, you know, separate rooms and um, when normally you would expect us to all be sitting in a room together and I'll be, you know, cheering and sharing how excited we are and instead we're doing that separately and then for, I mean, probably an hour afterward we took turns just talking about how excited we were and, you know, the background of uh, where we all came from coming into the experiment. Some people came from the previous experiment even and so for them it's really exciting to see this uh, repeat of the measurement uh, pay off like that really exciting yeah that was that was awesome sitting here watching watching that and the results and uh, many people don't know like you people saw the result like way before it was it like, yeah. before it was announced so I am just beyond impressed that everyone was able to keep that to, to themselves for as long as they did so that was yeah. pretty awesome too yeah I think opening that envelope was six weeks before the announcement so we all had to keep it under wraps for that long <laughs> is impressive for a collaboration that size. That's pretty awesome. Um, so we did have a question in the Q&A uh, related to the video um, asking how powerful is the magnet? It's, well, we, we measure it in Tesla. So it, it's formal strength is 1.5 Teslas in strength. And that's a little abstract. So it's, it's a powerful, it's a really strong magnet, but it's nothing out of the ordinary, I would say. It, it happened, I mean, you see this in your, I, I, maybe not everyday life, but I think the first example I have in mind is this roughly the same strength as, 
as you have magnets in, in the hospital if you get a, a MRI, so if you get kind of treatment, it's kind of the same scale. And maybe you remember, right, if you are in hospital to get a picture, you really need to get all your metal parts off your body. And, and that's kind of the same strength we have. So we have, we have like two meters area where there's basically not allowed to be anything magnetic because it would get sucked in if it gets too, too, too close to it. Just, and the, I think the, the amazing thing about the magnet is not so much the strength, it's more the, the, the size of the right. You, you saw it in video, it's really it's as large as a large building. And then given the size, it's still, it's really, 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 really uniform around the field, uh, around the whole ring. That, that's the kind of the, the amazing thing about that magnet. It's not so much the strength, but how, we, how, how uniform it is. And um, another question, we'll take one more question before we switch to the virtual tour. How many muons do you have to send into the ring to make all your measurements? Yeah, so, um, so first, our first result consisted of measuring about 4 billion muons. But out of what we actually send into the ring, that's only a tiny fraction of what actually gets sent in. So that's because we send in muons that have a, a larger range of momentum than we can actually store in our experiment. And so we have to send in about 100 times more muons than we expect to actually be able to measure. Um, so 100 times 4 billion is the number of muons that we needed to make that measurement. So we'll, um, as questions come in throughout the tour, we'll try to get to them at, at the end. Um, so now I want to switch gears to the virtual tour. Um, these are some behind the scenes um, that you won't be, you would not be able to see um, even if you took the tour on site. And um, this Simon put this together for us, so I really appreciate the time he took to um, build this for us and take taking footage himself and taking footage from other um, events that we've had. So um, I'm going to go ahead and switch to that. And again, as you have uh, questions, put them in the Q&A. And when the tour is concluded, we'll get to as many as we can. Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the Muon campus at Fermilab. So what you see here in front of me, it's, uh, it's MC1. It's the main building in, in, in the Muon campus. That's where the GMS2 experiment is. The other part of the Muon campus is uh, the building over here. That's uh, a new building where the Mu2E experiment will eventually be, be in. So while we're approaching the building, you see this uh, huge tank here. So that's a liquid nitrogen tank. This is uh, used for our cryogenics to keep our magnet cold, as we'll show you afterwards. Now inside the building, so we enter the building. What you see here is our control room with a well, one coordinator. We move on. And here on the right side, this is our computer room. We're gonna visit this uh, at the end of the tour again, as I show you where it is now. So what are you going to do now? Uh, first, we go we enter the hall. So you have to go through this uh, L-shaped labyrinth here. I need to use my key to go to, into the room. And now we are entering the experimental hall. Here on the right side, you see our, our storage ring, our magnet, where we actually store the muons. This is... We go on to the what we call the catwalk to the center where we will meet Hogan who will give you an introduction to the experiment. So over here um, is Hogan, one of the, the scientists who work on the experiment. Um, Hogan, you're set up to do more pulse-ups in the ring. Did you want to uh, show people the different uh, parts in the ring? Oh, good morning, everyone. Here's a picture of our ring. And um, you know what? I'm, all I'm going to do first is to point out where the beep entered. So I'm going to zoom in my camera. Okay, so those are uh, <clears throat> what I've zoomed in on is the injection beam line. And so the beam entered our ring at a tangent. Okay. And then that's so, so that's what so the beam is coming from, uh, from the left, of the, right of the screen to the left. Okay. And all I'm, 
what I'm going to do now is just zoom over and then show you this uh, this big blue box and this uh, this set of piping. So this is our main uh, our main magnet power supply that's underneath this blue this blue box, and this is all of the helium plant that we need to supply to keep the magnet cold at five Kelvin. Okay. So I'm gonna then I'm gonna go over here to show you these cables. So the muons come in and a tangent, and at 90 degrees around the ring, the muons uh, get a kick from a from a magnetic kicker, and that puts the kick onto the stored orbit. Okay. So this kicker is a pretty serious piece of hardware, and we uh, it's, it's basically a one turn magnet that we have 5,000 amps of current in a, in a time domain of about uh, 100 nanoseconds. So it's, it's one of our most important uh, device that kicks the, or the muons onto orbit. Otherwise, we don't store. And so this is a pretty serious piece of hardware. Uh, hey, so Simon, why don't you talk about the magnetic field? Yeah, sure. Sorry. So, I mean, Hogan already mentioned, right? So, we did, I mean, the whole ring here you see is actually it's this large superconducting um, 1.45 Tesla field to actually store the muons. And and what one of the we, one of the measurements we do, we, we store the muons, and then we measure the precession frequency. I think we come to this later. The second thing we need to do is to to measure the magnetic field the muons actually experience, and we do this with NMR technique. I mean, yeah, so here on the left side, you basically see a cross section through, through, the, through the ring you saw before, where we basically have the muons here in the muon region, it's, it's the, the red dots are the muons. And then we have, yeah, we have this large magnetic superconducting coils um, producing this 1.45 Tesla magnetic field um, vertically, so up down direction, so that it bends the muons onto the to orbit to actually store them. The system, well, but you see on this poster on, on this slide is kind of the support systems to make the field homogeneous. So one of the main tasks in the beginning of the experiment was to, to make the field around the, the ring as homogeneous as possible. That's what you see on, on, the, on the right side, basically a huge shimming campaign where you see the, the deviation of the field in, in red first here. And then after all this shimming, and I come to this in a second, it basically ends up really homogeneous in, in the blue, in the blue uh, line over here. This shimming of the field is done with different parts. So there's these pole pieces, uh, I'm back on, on the left side. These are, the, these guide basically the field and that there, there's wedges we can insert and remove to, to move these pole pieces a little bit, uh, uh, gym the field really roughly. And then we have um, shown here on top right side, there's a lamination. So these are little foils that are kind of, well, it's first measured, then they are inserted to shim out kind of uh, more local uh, variations. And then in addition, we have an active shimming system that's shown in the center, it's basically the electronics, uh, where we can actively shim out the uh, um, gradients around the ring. So so you measure the field, uh, I guess, so So you did that over uh, about a year from October 2015 to August 2016. And uh, that took uh, a whole year almost. Uh, and so you, you measure the magnetic field and at a location, it's that red line in the in the plot at the lower right. And then you can you can calculate how many of these iron strips to place at a location. Uh, and then you place them, and then you measure again, uh, and then you repeat until you get to the the blue line. That's that's the procedure. That's right. Yeah. So back then there was this dedicated measurement device. Um, I don't think we have a picture here that was inserted between the gap of the pole pieces, and, and was basically tiered around the ring to measure the magnetic field around the ring back then for the shimming. So it was basically measured, then it was corrected for and measured again after, right? So this is a long, long process with many iterations to get to, to basically this, uh, well, to this 50 ppm variations around the ring we here in August 2016, which says kind of goal accomplished. This was done before the vacuum chambers were installed. I think afterwards we probably see the vacuum chambers. So now the vacuum chambers are installed and uh, now we have a different device, which we call a trolley, it's the field mapper. 
and this is, sits inside the, the vacuum chambers on 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 wheels and the, uh, sorry on wheels and it's pulled around the ring now to actually map out and measure the magnetic field roughly every three days for, for our measurements. Simon, can you talk about this object here? Yeah, so that's that's very good. Yeah, so before I, I told you, we have this field mapper, which is this trolley. Uh, it sits inside the it sits inside the ring, and, and it needs to be pulled around. Great. Yeah, that's how it looks like. Um, that's the trolley. It well, on one side there's basically electronics, which is here on the left side, and on the other side it has these NMR probes, which uh, well are not shown here. It's yeah, it's similar to the one that's shown on top. Um, we have 17 of them. Uh, they are kind of located. Uh, they are yeah. They are in the configuration shown on the right side at the bottom, and these measure the magnetic field that met with uh, well in slices around the ring. And this device has two has a cable um, and and it's pulled through through the ring by by large drums, and that's what Hogan showed before. So if we, we go back to Hogan's camera. So you see. So the, these are this is basically the. Well, inside this large box are the drums that pull this uh, this device, the trolley around the ring, and, and the cables go in into the, the on, on the left side, they go into the, the ring, and then they go around the ring for this pulling. Uh, does, does someone online want to talk about the quad? Sure, I'd be glad to. So, um, yeah, this is a, a view here in this picture on the left. Um, yeah, showing what the quad plates look like. So. Yeah, a, a positive charge is applied, um, yeah, to the plates that are above and below um, the storage volume where the muons are in the middle here. Um, yeah, causing them to be, because they're, they're actually anti-muons, they're positively charged muons, um, to be repelled towards the center. So basically the, um, the ensemble of muons is kept vertically centered by being repelled away from, um, yeah, from the top and bottom plates, you would say that that would have a destabilizing effect um, horizontally, right? Because um, you know, although they're being stabilized vertically by always being pushed towards the center, um, they're yeah being pulled towards the side by the negative charge that has to be applied there um, to keep it balanced. So uh, the way that that ends up working out is that. The magnetic field itself, together with the, um, you know, the magnetic force on the charged particles in a non-inertial reference frame, yeah, the net effect of all of that is still focusing horizontally, in spite of the fact that the electrostatic force is defocusing horizontally, and so that means that we get between the electric and magnetic fields um, a net stabilizing effect, pushing the um, yeah, the muons back towards the center of the quad plates. So um, yeah, here you can see some of the hardware, but I think you'll get better views of the hardware from somebody closer up with the camera. Um, yeah, but yeah, there are um, yeah eight sets of four plates that are placed inside the vacuum chambers around the ring. And in our normal operation now, we um, charge those up to 18,200 volts um, for most of the time that the muons are um, confined in there. Um, hey, I can talk about uh, what these students are doing. Um, oh, they, they're shy, they got off camera. <laughs> uh, they are working on the quarter pole and they are, they're, uh, they're working on an upgrade to the quarter pole where we, so normally the quarter poles, as Fred said, have a basically have a static voltage on them. So what we uh, the idea that was uh, proposed at Brookhaven and now it's being implemented now is we could put a, a time varying voltage on the quad plate. Okay, so, and we we use a specific frequency. We just modulate the, the voltage by about a kilovolt or so, and uh, we we learned that we can make the beam look a lot better. So. When the beam comes in, it uh, it doesn't come perfectly onto a circular orbit, uh, centered orbit. So it it swims, it uh, it oscillates about the ideal orbit. And so what this device that we're upgrading, uh, we're, we're adding to the quad, 
system that will make the uh, that will minimize this oscillation. Sure, I'd be glad to to mention a few things about the callos. Um, so let's uh, let's see our poster about that. So yeah, the the calorimeters there are 24 of them. They are these um, yeah sliding carts that move in and out. The uh, yeah the active element of the calorimeter is in this box right at the end that fits snugly against the vacuum chamber, and so. Yeah, that box contains an array of lead fluoride crystals. And, and so here you can see um, lead fluoride crystals glowing under ultraviolet illumination. Um, and so, yeah, they produce light that way um, in a similar way when um, ionizing uh, radiation goes through them and produces light through the, the Cherenkov effect, which basically means, that, yeah, that it's the light that's produced to- um, It's a good time to talk about the laser room. You want to go in now. Well, I can also show them the okay. corner and then and all that stuff. Yeah. I can show um, them also the Okay. So yeah, the uh um Cherenkov effect effectively is what happens um when a particle is exceeding the local speed of light in the medium that it's in. It has to slow down to get below the speed of light, and the energy and momentum are taken away as visible light photons. Um and so that's uh yeah. The, that is what produces the light that the calorimeters end up seeing that becomes our, our signal, um, effectively proportional to the energy of the positrons that go into um, these crystals. So each of the lead fluoride crystals has um, attached to it a silicon photomultiplier, which is on you know a circuit board that probably is the size of sort of a large thumb, um, the end of your Last, last joint on your thumb. Um, and so that's uh, glued on to the end of the lead fluoride crystal. The silicon photomultiplier produces an electrical signal that um, yeah, then is digitized by waveform digitizers that are basically like computer connected oscilloscopes um, that record the entire waveform from the entire time that the muon beam was circulating inside the vacuum chambers and yeah that goes into the graphics processing units and um on yeah a uh, yeah a set of computers and the gpus which were you know of course originally developed for computer gaming um are very good at extracting the physics parameters like the times and energies of the pulses that were recorded by these digitizers so now I see that Jason's camera is going into a yeah uh, a dark place called the laser hut. Uh, um, yeah, let let me find what I can show you about the laser hut here. So right, yeah. So he's inside this black box that you see here that has an INFN. That's uh, the Italian Nuclear Physics Institute. Um, logo on the outside they did really yeah basically all of the construction of the laser system um and so yeah inside there yeah he is showing you a view of an optical table that's all covered up with the uh, um with black panels so that the uh yeah the laser is um yeah is kept safe from humans and humans are kept safe from laser beams so uh, that's an interlocked enclosure that only experts uh, like this person featured in the picture can open. Um, that is a picture of what's inside that black box. Um, we always, of course, keep it uh, covered except when an optical expert is tuning and aligning the, uh, the system. And so the optical fibers that come out of this big array of lasers and splitters, um, yeah, it, it's sort of fanned out to all of the calorimeters. Um, so yeah, those optical fibers are, yeah, are further split and um, yeah, one goes to each calorimeter and then they're split again at the calorimeter so that uh, um, yeah, there is an optical fiber, you know, carrying light from one of these lasers um, into um, every single lead fluoride crystal in every single one of the, the calorimeters. 
What does it do then? Why, why do we flash lasers on the calorimeters? That is a really great question. Thanks, uh, thanks for asking it. So um, yeah, basically we know that the response of the silicon photomultiplier is not going to be stable. So we know that when you, um, when you hit them with a lot of light, then their pixels are occupied and they aren't available to respond to more light. So that means that after they've been hit with a, a pulse, they're going to produce a somewhat smaller response for the next pulse. We need to flatten that out so that the response of the silicon photomultiplier is independent of time. And so what we can do is, um, is to map the response of the calorimeters to the known laser pulses that, um, yeah, that are known to be stable versus time and that are measured by separate detectors um, so that we can monitor that stability. And so we can basically apply corrections that force the um, reconstructed energies of the laser pulses to be constant over time. Um, and you know, if we can do that, then we are making the response to the positron signals that we're trying to detect constant over time as well. Fascinating. Thank you, Fred. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, so, hey, uh, how about may I make a suggestion? Why don't we have uh, late Jason show show us around the ring, tour around the outside of the ring, and then we have a nice video of what of what the muon would, would see. And I think that was prepared by Simon. So yeah, as, as you as you were saying, uh, here's the uh, gas monitoring system for our tracker detectors which are used to um, reconstruct uh, the tracks of the decay positrons. And so as I continue around the ring here, I'm going towards uh, what we call the kicker corner. And this is where the high voltage electronics uh, sit for our kicker system. So you can see here, it's, it's generated um, behind this, this high voltage, or gate protecting the high voltage area. We have uh, control electronics here, and then the voltage um, pulses are generated in these green lines here, and then eventually sent to cables that then go over the top of the ring uh, to the vacuum chambers where they're fed through into the vacuum chamber. The high voltage pulses are fed into the vacuum chamber system. As we continue around, we're going to come to where the beam uh, comes into the, the ring. And where um, the cooling system for the reflector magnet is located. So um, here is uh, where the cryo, cryo goes in for the reflector magnet. And this is used to uh, channel the beam uh, into the storage ring uh, where the reflector magnet basically cancels out the field uh, to get the beam inside the storage ring. But over here, you can see um, these are the final focus uh, quadrupole magnets um, coming from the accelerator line. And if you look here, we have a couple of detectors uh, that we use to monitor the incoming beam. One of them we call the T0, and this gives us the time structure of the incoming beam. And then we also have what we call IBMS detectors, which give us horizontal and vertical uh, profiles of the, of the beam distribution. You can't really see, but there's basically a hole in the outside uh, iron of the magnet so that the beam can enter uh, into the storage ring uh, vacuum chamber system. Yeah, and it actually enters through a magnet called the inflector, um, which is yeah another superconducting magnet that cancels out the magnetic field of the main magnet. So that's what's placed sort of. Uh, inside the hole, inside the steel that you see the, the beam being aimed into. And the aperture of the uh, inflector is so narrow that this is what we need, uh, the quadruple magnets immediately upstream of that to focus the beam right into the very narrow aperture. Yeah, here you can actually see the inflector magnet. You can see where it's placed. Yeah, 
I guess, yeah, in case you're wondering, um, yeah, this is what the magnet looked like. It's blue um, underneath all the insulation. Um, but underneath that, uh, that box um, is where the inflector magnet is placed. And Jason was just showing you, you know, the, the view of the beam entering right around there. And so, yeah, you know, it produces a 1.45 Tesla field that's opposed to the 1.45 Tesla field of the main magnet. Um, and so the, uh, yeah, you know, the muons travel through an, an aperture that really is only, you know, uh, about, yeah, on the order of a few centimeters high and 10 centimeters wide. I don't remember the exact dimensions off the top of my head. It's, uh, it's this size on a poster that's printed out uh, um, to be a meter wide. Okay. Uh, hey, how about... Um, Simon has uh, has this beautiful video, but then uh, after that, we could actually go into the DAC, the DAQ room too. We haven't shown that. It's fairly important, obviously. Uh, take it away, Simon. Sounds good. Maybe before we start, uh, we I, I mentioned we have this trolley, this field mapper. We have inside the ring, and this what you're going to see is a, is a video from from this. Um, where we had a camera mounted on, on front of it, the GoPro. So that's where the, the video material comes from. And you're going to see kind of a speed indication on the left side. So that's speed with respect to this field mapper. It's not speed with respect to the muons, obviously. Yeah, so I think we are ready to go then. Um, yeah, so on the left side, that's where we just were. So on the left side, where, where this marker is. So that's where they, they enter. And then I think the first thing you're going to see is, is uh, the quadrupole plates and the manolis. Uh, just mentioned. So yeah, so we kind of the first thing you enter are these quadrupole plates, the ESQs. Um, I, I'll talk about. Uh, we have a little better view of them later on. Then for the muons, the next station that's kind of important, well, most important to tear them onto the orbit are, are these kickers. So these are the kickers VBC. So right, so they produce a field horizontally to tear the the muons actually into into orbit. With three of them, so that was the first one. Now we are kind of 90 degrees around the ring. There's a second one. There's a third one. Yeah, and then I think we're going to slow down a little bit to have a closer look on the quadrupole plate that comes afterwards. So these we have these four plates. You see these leads that uh, charge the quadrupole plates. And um, 43 percent of the ring are actually covered by by these plates. This goes on. Now we are kind of 180 degrees from, from the injection, or oh, approaching 180 degrees. On the right side, there's going to be the, what we call a trolley garage. So this trolley, this field mapper, has to move outside of the of the path of the muons when we when we actually saw the muons. So this part of the rail you can see here can be retracted radially to the right. So where we are now basically moves to the right to get the trolley outside of, of, the, of the path. Then here on the right side, that's what we call it. The, it's a it's an NMR probe. We call it plunging probe. Uh, it sits on a 3D stage and can be inserted into the ring to calibrate, uh, abs absolute calibrates the, the measurement of the NMR probe of this field mapper with respect to this really well understood probe you see on, on the right side. After this, there's going to be more quadrupole plates. Um, yeah, so sorry, yeah, now here these are quadrupole plates. There's another set. We, we have them in sets of long and, and then there's first short and then long plates. Um, what you have seen, but I've not talked about yet, are these uh, are these collimators. So during muon storage, the collimators are in, so that they are actually collimated to be in. But during the operations of this mapper, they, they have to be switched out, as you just saw. I think the next thing you're going to see is a, is a special. Uh, well, it's a it's an outer fiber harp. So these are scintillating fibers. Uh, I call them the agnostics here because we don't use them during operations because they are dis destructive. So we cannot store efficiently muons with, with them in. Then here on the right side, these are the trackers. It's a straw tracker station. You saw earlier one, there's one station. We have two stations. That's the, the second station, which is fully equipped here. Then we have another set of quadrupoles. So now we are kind of around 270 degrees. We're approaching basically uh, the where, where we started again. So you will see the inflector on the left side coming up again. Yeah, right here, it's the inflector. And then obviously the muons, they go around the ring many, many more times until they decay. I think I try to indicate this in just a second. Yeah. When they decay into elect positrons, in, in our case, the positrons drift towards smaller radius, and then they basically, when they hit the, the calorie meters, we chart behind this wall here. Okay. So, so this is um, our gas room where 
we um, keep uh, the computers that we use to uh, collect all the data that we generate. And so you can see over here, uh, we just keep them in racks. Uh, this is actually right next to the control room, uh, if you remember from earlier. And, um, you know, the really piece of, of important equipment uh, in the DAC room is our master clock. And so, you know, at its core, G minus two is about measuring uh, two, two frequencies that we use to determine the muon anomaly. And so to precisely measure frequencies, you need a very um, precise uh, clock. And this is stored over here. Now, to try and prevent um, unintended bias uh, in the analysis, we use blinding um, for, with our analysis. And so basically we, we have a, a secret offset um, in the clock uh, frequency. So we don't quite know what the true frequency is. And so this is um, done here with our clock. And so we have two people who aren't actually collaborators uh, come up with that offset and then regularly come and inspect the, um, the clock uh, frequency to make sure um, it stays uh, with the same offset over time. And so when we're taking data, uh, this there would be a panel preventing anyone um, from seeing uh, what the actual setting of the clock is. Uh, so it's just these two individuals who aren't collaborators uh, know what the offset is. Why is blinding needed? Well, you know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, people, you know, everybody does their best, but obviously, um, people are interested in finding new physics. And so if you know um, what the answer, you know, if you know what the standard model prediction is for the mu one anomaly, and you know what your data um, basically is telling you, you can unintentionally pick cuts that shift uh, what your, your measured value is one way or another. And so blinding is a way to, to prevent people from unintentionally uh, shifting uh, their answer to be a more interesting answer. And so that, that's why we use blinding um, in this analysis. Hogan, you have your hand up? Yeah, yeah. You know what? Um, can we... And this shows a nice picture of the muon G minus two collaboration back in May of 2019. Um, so I love seeing that view of the what like the muon C as it goes through the ring. It doesn't matter how many times you get to see that. It's pretty cool um, that we were able to get that. Um, so we've got some great questions um, so far. I think the first one that we should probably start with is where do we get our muons? Yeah, I can comment about that. Um, so typically, um, you know, muons in nature are all around us. Uh, they come from uh, particles, charged particles colliding with our atmosphere and through a bunch of interactions uh, that happen after that, you end up with a number of muons kind of raining down around us all the time. And so that happens in nature. If you hold out your hand for a minute, then you get like 100 muons passing through your hand. Um, but we intentionally produce muons at Fermilab. So we um, uh, do something very intentional to create what we call a beam of muons. And you can kind of think of it like a laser beam, but, but wider that's made out of muons instead of light. Um, and so for us, that process starts with protons and we smash protons into what we call a target, which is the, a big thick piece of metal. And then that produces another intermediate particle called a pion, and those pions decay into muons um, to, to get the muons that we use in our experiment. And then we also have a number of steps that we have to do to clean all of the other particles, the protons and the, the pions out so that we're really left with a pure muon beam. Awesome. And there's a couple of questions about if there, this recording will be shared. And yes, I will, I will send the recording out to um, everyone that signed up for this. So thank you for asking that. Um, there was uh, another question asking, um, what are the muons properties? So the muons, I mean, I, yeah. So in principle, the muon is really, really similar to electrons. So the property is really the same. The only difference 
we are kind of aware of the moment it's in the standard model it's really that they are heavier and and i mean this is really a question we a question in the sense we are trying to answer right so this measurement of this g factor of g minus two but the g factor is really a property in, in the sense of, of the muon so in a sense we are basically measuring properties of the muons that are or better measuring that are predicted and we, we are measuring it and the prediction of this property of the muon doesn't doesn't align well with our measurements yet and that's why it's so interesting because this like, this means either there's i mean something is is, is wrong with, with what we are measuring but uh, we believe we, we do our job good or there's something wrong in, in the theory that kind of describes this property of the muon and then yeah i think that's so uh, someone asked, um, and since you mentioned that they are similar to the electron, could you run an experiment like this with electrons? Yeah, and um, so in fact, the the this G factor is something that you can measure from the muon or from the electron as well as the muon. Uh, but the reason that we want to do this experiment with muons is because they're about two hundred times heavier than electrons, and that means we're a lot more sensitive. We're 200 squared times more sensitive, it turns out, uh, to this, this anomaly, the, the little bit that's larger than two, uh, than with electrons. So we really, really, we really want to do this measurement with muons, but the, the measurement uh, of this G factor with electrons is something that's also really important in particle physics. And um, there's a question, you mentioned particles that pop into our universe and affect our muons. Can you go into that more? Yes, I mean that's I mean that's pretty much what it is. So the just by kind of the, the most naive approach is this that this G factor, this is uh, equals two, that's kind of the standard for for the particles if you just imagine a particle going around. And then this is a theory basically um, of, of the standard model that describes that vacuum is not completely empty, so the vacuum there are particles popping out interacting and, and disappear. This is really, 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 really fast. And now these, these particles that pop out, they can interact with the muons we have in our ring. And, and then they would basically modify this G factor a little bit and then they disappear. So this is really an a indirect way to, to measure what pops out of the vacuum and disappears. And this theory I was talking about the standard model by talking about this basically describes this process of all the particles that can pop out how they interact with particles and they, they disappear again. So if we now measure something that's different, this means something else basically is going on. So there's either I mean different interactions or particles that we are not that are not described in, in our theory. Can I and can I just highlight one thing that I think is really cool about that is of course. Uh, is that the particles that are popping in and out of existence, that's all of the particles that exist in nature. And so uh, the standard model, we think, is a list of all of the particles that exist in nature. But if there's something we missed, then that's included in, in what the muons are feeling, but it's just not included in our list. So the muons can be experiencing some particles that we don't actually know exist. And I think that's really cool. It is really cool. Um, there was a question about uh, during the trolley ride, I noticed the high voltage focus plates had screws and washers on the flat plate for attachment. Doesn't that disturb the electric field in some way to cause a wobble in the particles? Yes, to some extent, yes. But I mean, they, in a sense, they're really designed to have a, as homogeneous field as possible. And, 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 and that's kind of, they are designed to minimize these effects. And in particularly, I mean, what would be really bad is to have kind of an edge because there you have really, really strong fields. And this actually happens sometimes. So if, if, there's, if there's vacuum, so there's almost no particles left, but there's still a little bit something left. And then sometimes we get, we, get, we get a spark from one plate to, to the other one or to, to the ground. This, this basically discharges it, and then we have to basically kind of reduce it a little bit, and we have to ramp up the voltage so that it can run again. So that's, I mean, that's completely correct. We really need to make sure that there's basically no sharp, sharp edges to that disturb the field too much. And we also have to keep track carefully of when those sparks happen and when anything weird like that happens, um, you know, during, during our experiment so that we cut that out of the data that we use in our final analysis. 
And um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more. Um, you both work on making sure that that magnetic field is super uniform and the uh, with what the mutants, how if you want to both talk a little bit about how that's done um, and why that's important. Maybe Simon can talk about the first part and I can talk about the second part. Yeah, so we, we I mean, there was a lot of work spent in the beginning of building and then kind of adjusting the magnet so that it's really, really homogeneous, so that the field around the ring is really, it's really uniform. I think I saw in my question 50 ppm, so it's, it's more like 17 ppm around, around the ring, so it's a factor two better than it, it was before. And now this, we have this field that we operated and we, we have some knobs we can, we can adjust. Um, we can kind of tilt the field a little bit so that it gets really, really uniform. And then once we have this, the, the, the task is really to, to measure it. So we, we measure it roughly every three to four days with this little trolley device that goes in. This is on this garage. Um, we basically put it in and then it goes around the ring and it takes basically three hours to go two times around and then it's kind of retracted so it goes out of the ring again. And this, this field camera measures the field. And in between, we have, we, have, um, we have measurement devices outside so that the muons can actually pass. We use these to, to track the changes of the field over, over time. That's, that's the, the main activity is really now to, to measure the field as good as we can. Then I think we... Cool. Yeah, and then um, I actually, is it OK, Amanda, if I share a yep, we should slide be good. about second part of that question. So this is something that I worked on. So now I hope, can you see a, a full screen slide here? Yes. Cool. OK, great. Uh, yeah, so so as far as why this is important, so um, remembering this picture of the ring where the muons are running around like a racetrack, uh, if we take a slice out of the ring and look at inside one of those slices, um, you can map both the intensity of the where the muons are located, and that's done with the straw tracker detectors that were in Simon's uh, trolley ride video. Uh, and you can also map from the trolley that Simon was just talking about the strength of the magnetic field inside that slice. And this is a map of the strength of the magnetic field, where in the yellow parts it's a little bit stronger, in the, the blue parts it's a little bit of a weaker magnetic field. And this, like Simon said, this is really, really uniform, even though it looks kind of uh, non-uniform here. It's uniform to the sixth decimal place. Um, but that's even still important for us. So if you now, let's see, if you now overlay this muon map with the magnetic field map, you can see that the muons are located, this is what it looks like in the early part of the experiment, the muons are concentrated sort of in this one area where the magnetic field is a little bit weaker. And so if you, if you take the average of the magnetic field where the muons are actually concentrated, you see that that's a, a little bit smaller than if you took the average of the magnetic field everywhere. And it's smaller by this tiny, tiny amount, about 150 parts per billion. That's like the seventh decimal place. Um, but even that is important for us because our measurement is so precise. Our measurement uh, of our, our first result was 460 parts per billion. So for these really precise measurements, we really care about these tiny effects, like the, the tiny amount of non-uniformity on top of this very smooth magnetic field. Awesome. And I'm just um, being mindful of the time, and I know there's like a ton of great questions, but um, the one that I think might be nice, uh, well, quickly, how fast do the muons travel? I don't, I don't think that one will mm. take too much time. Yeah, they're just, just under the speed of light. So like 99.9%, uh, I think is the number. Long enough that, uh, that they experience time dilation. And so instead of a two microsecond lifetime uh, time before they decay, it's uh, time dilated to about 64 microseconds. And so this one's interesting um, because I'm sure you would get different answers from different people depending on what part of the experiment they work on. Um, what has been the most challenging aspect of this experiment? Simon, if you want to go first. I, well, I think you get the same answer of a lot of people. <laughs> I think the really, the really challenge of this experiment is really the, how precise we need to measure it or we're measuring it. So this effect is, is incredibly, it's incredibly well calculated and we, we need, we measure it on the same level. And so it's, 
so small that just this, the tiniest effects are, are really important. And, and, and it's, yeah, I think that's the challenge that just to, we have to think about all the really, really tiniest, smallest effects. Um, some vibration somewhere could have potentially really an, an impact and we need to understand just all, all these things. And I think this is really independent from where you are in the experiment. It's just, we, we need to, to understand just everything to the really, really smallest detail. Yeah, and uh, kind of related to that is the fact that we have to actually measure 20 times more muons than what we measured at Brookhaven, uh, the previous uh, G minus two experiment. And so making sure that we can, uh, that our that our muon beam is intense and pure enough and, and that we can actually get those muons inside the experiment is a whole series of challenges so that we can actually collect enough data to get this uh, very high precision result that we're after. Awesome, and thank you both so much for joining us um, for this virtual tour. This was, I always learned so much um, from this, so I really appreciate it. Um, thank you to everyone that joined us. Um, I hope to see you at some of our other virtual open house events. We've got a great lecture tonight on how to do big science. Um, we have Fermilab trivia tomorrow. Mr. Free's cryogenic show is gonna be live streamed. So if you've been missed, missing the cryogenic shows, um, you can check that out. Um, we've also got Iron Scientist. Um, tomorrow evening, um, we've got two scientists that got a mystery box of ingredients and they had, were challenged to do science demos, so that'll be fun. And then uh, Sunday, we wrap up with uh, Ask an, Engin Ask an Engineer, um, A World Without Atmosphere. So again, thank you all for being here. Uh, Simon and Bryn, thank you so much uh, for being a part of this virtual tour and taking our questions. And um, to the audience, thank you all for your engagement. This was great. Thank you so much. And Thanks enjoy so the rest of your evening or day, depending on where you're joining us from. <laughs>